So welcome everyone to Carving a New Path. This podcast is filled with stories and tools and resources to help you pause and reflect on the life you are living and opening to new possibilities. Most of us were raised in a society that encourages productivity and do, do, do. But when a life circumstance, like a job layoff or an illness or the birth or death of a loved one comes along, it disrupts your daily routine and it gives you a chance to pause and reflect on your life, a chance to practice going inward. Well, the show today is called Poetry and Parenthood with my guest, Frank Mundo. And in this episode, Frank and I are gonna talk about parenthood and the journey that he and his wife, Nancy, had with trying to conceive a child, the exploration of medical solutions, and a journey that led them to foster two children and then adopt. Well, Frank is a writer in Rancho Cucamongo, California, where he lives with his wife, Nancy, and their twin three-year-olds. And he's the author of Touched by an Anglo, and it's from the Katie Wampus Press. That's where it's, you can find that book. Frank's stories and poems focus mainly on identity and family, themes Frank speaks about at high schools and colleges. As a child, Frank and his siblings were in the foster care system in Maryland, and today he is an advocate for foster and adopted kids and their parents. Frank will be reading some of his poetry about parents, step-parents, and trying to become parents from his book, Touched by an Anglo. And I've posted a link to his author page on Amazon with many of his books and a link to his page for Touched by an Anglo that's on the Katie Wampus Press page. Okay, with all of that taken care of, Frank, welcome to the show. Hi, Andrea. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you again. It is good to see you. And I mean, the last time we did a radio show, it was about grief. And that was back in 2010, which is when we met through our friend Shelly Rationau. Yeah, that was was an interesting uh, uh, call. I really enjoyed that. So I'm I'm looking forward to today and talking to you about, you know, becoming a parent and all the the ups and downs that's involved in it and the poetry that I write in response to that. Well, I'm so happy that uh, when I put out a call to, hey, does anyone want to be a guest on this show that, that you said yes, because I have watched from afar, you know, stalking you on Instagram <laughs> and Facebook that I knew there was something going on in the last few years. And every once in a while, you would share a little tidbit, like that there were kids and, and then it was that you weren't posting on social media. and. And so I'm, I'm so happy that you're here because I really want to, I think it's a great topic for everyone to hear this journey. And I, I'm ready for you to fill in the details that I couldn't pick up on social media. Totally. So I know that you said that six years ago, you and Nancy decided that you wanted to become parents. Yes? Yeah, so it was, it was, we had been married at that time, maybe four, almost five years. And, you know, we had gotten financially, we got, we got into a place where we thought, okay, now it's time for us to, you know, start having a family, start doing that stuff, what goal we always wanted to have. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I was getting older. I was, I was, I was 40 at the time and, mm-hmm. and uh, it was, it wasn't working out. It wasn't, it wasn't this happening the way we thought we were hoping it would. And we, you know, we gave it a little time. They said, you know, we, we got to keep, got to keep trying, keep planning. We tried these different apps. We tried different ways to conceive and it just, for whatever reason, it wasn't happening for us. So we, we decided to kind of go for, um, uh, see the doctor medical options, see if we were something wrong with us, maybe something we could do to help the process. And we each, we each were okay. There was no, uh, there wasn't any medical things that were wrong. There wasn't um, any. There wasn't any reason why we shouldn't be getting pregnant, but mm-hmm. we just weren't. And they said maybe we're too stressed out. We're too. We're too focused on it. We're too something. Maybe um, you know. I took like prescription pills for like for my heart, like for cholesterol and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I thought maybe that had something to do with it. But 
no, it was like everything was fine. Mm -hmm. So we kept trying, still no success. So at some point we decided to see the specialist. Maybe there's something they could do uh, or what options were available. And that's where we went on to, you know, um, in vitro, other, other ways we can, other ways we could conceive to see medically. And, um, well, I should probably say before that, um, in order for us to get into this spot, to be ready to have, to be parents, mm -hmm. um, my wife decided maybe she wanted to be a stay at home, a stay at home mom. Mm -hmm. So in order for us to do that, we had to sort of rebudget, re rejigger our, our, our budget so that she could, uh, you know, my wife was uh, director of HR, so we had to cut out like six figures of our income uh -huh. and try. So talk about up, upending your whole life sure, and changing sure. our life. We had to make that decision. And that's what I was talking about in the beginning about the financial part. So now here we are. She's quit her job. She's nesting. She's doing everything the doctors say, and it's not working. Something's not right. We're, we're not working. And then that's when we get into more of the medical, the medical part of it. And um, this was a really difficult time for me. I know a lot, like you hear, you don't hear a lot of men talking about this process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when it, when it comes to conceiving and you're not able to, like as a man, it's kind of like, I'm not a man or so, there's something inside of you that that's kind of, that, that, bothers you that upsets you and I think that makes makes it even worse it puts a little more pressure on you makes it even worse and so that was happening to me and like we were talking earlier about the poetry what I do when I when I get into those kind of places that's when I write that's when I focus on poetry that's when I use that tool for like catharsis to help me work things out to help me understand what I'm feeling and um, that's where a lot of the poems from the book come from this six year period of the, of the of this process you know as i as i decided to become a parent i started thinking about my my childhood mm -hmm. my family my my parents and i was i was a, a foster kid a foster child my brother and my sister and so we have a lot of um, complicated uh, relationships foster parents biological parents, uh, step parents, uh, step brothers, half brothers, there's a lot of, of that. And there's different parts of the family and different parts of places that, you know, they don't really communicate or do things. So that was, that was a part of it. And that's really what the book is about, like all of those. Well, I, I want to say that, that in getting ready for this show, you had sent me four poems. And yeah. as I read the poems, I was really thinking about how rare it is for me to read something so personal and tender from a man and to have your perspective. And it really, it really came through in the, in the poetry in a way that, um, you know, I'm always curious about people. And so I am someone who reads a lot and watches films and tries to look at things from different angles, not just from, me as a woman right. looking at only women but really trying to understand and it's such a gift in your poetry your ability to share that and share that tenderness and it to me it also expands the way we can think about life yeah. and think about parenthood you know that it seems like oh yeah it's just natural let's let's just do it and make a baby and right. it does you know life doesn't always work out that yeah. way yeah. It's that the, the first one at that time, like one of the first poems that I wrote um, was like these epistles. I call them epistles. Mm -hmm. They're like letters. Yes. But, but it's modern time, so I call them more like emails. So I, I see them as emails. So I, that's why I have a little regarding. Uh -huh. So I wrote one for each member of the family, right? So regarding your mother. Uh -huh. That was one, one of the first ones. And I wrote one for each member of my family. Okay. It's like a, a letter that I wrote to them, an email, but I never hit sent. Uh-huh. You know, like it's like that. I'm yeah. Gonna get, I'm gonna get right into it. I'm gonna say everything I want to say, and it might not be. Uh, it might be a little harsh. It might be funny. It might be 
like you said, tender. It might be, this depends on what is, what is I was feeling at that time. So the first one I can read it. It's, it's called Regarding Your Mother. Yes. So that one's on page 27. That one is, that one's a little angry, maybe. Mm -hmm. A little aggressive. But I think part of that, part of that process is working through whatever that is, whatever I'm feeling yeah. to do that. And so this is the, the email that I would have written to my mother and it's kind of in the book that way. It's mm -hmm. called Regarding Your Mother. It's, I wish I could interview another you. The one from 1972 with the Elvis sneer and the Joan Jett do, who knows all you've forgotten and remembers everything you knew. I'd ask, how did Apollo ever earn your trust? Did snakes lick your ears clean of his dirt and dust? That Kuro's ideal, son of light and lust. Was this liar's liar so inspiringly robust? Because honestly, I see no signs of Zeus, no bull, no eagle, and no golden goose. I see a bitter old fool, full of bile and abuse, a kind of soul is so only hate can produce. And now cursed with the truth no one can believe, and the pain of loss no one can relieve, I'd ask, why cling to the tangled web we grieve, holding back that final ace up your sleeve? I guess I'll never fully know the reasons why, and I'll never figure out how he drank you dry, but somewhere in the depths of truth lives a lie that will haunt me until the day I die. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the poem. Yeah. I'll tell you about. that it, it's, it's beautiful. And what really touched me with, uh, because luckily I got to read the poetry ahead of time also, but it really touched me that first of all, you started with, well, I would have liked to have known that, that woman before yeah. she was mom or when she was younger. And yeah. we don't always think about how our parents are people, right? That are just making their way through the world and they had a younger self and they had yeah. a, you know, that time period. Um, but then uh, your ability to express the anger and to not have it all tied up in a nice, neat little boat, like, oh, and now I forgive you. It's like, no, right. you know what? Sometimes it's like, I, I'm not going to be able to go back and do that. And it's still going to haunt me. Um, yeah, I think, like, too, the, when you, you know, when I think about that anger, the anger comes from that other person, that one before. Uh -huh. Like, my mother's not that, she's not that person anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, when she was younger, she's... You know, she did a she did a good job of, of raising me and doing her best she could do. That that poem, the anger comes from the uncertainty, the not like just not knowing what, what why did this happen? Why did why was this going on? Like, yeah. um, and as a a child or someone who's gone through that and then not really addressed it until I'm what forty years old. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there's a lot of uh, baggage there. So that was really what brought that that brought that about and that's right about the same time that we're trying to have that i'm trying to become that mm -hmm. so here i am this person i'm thinking maybe my kids might do the same thing right uh, yeah what, what, was he, what was he thinking about then or, uh -huh. you know you know there's always going to be um some looking back and you know i'm going to make mistakes i'm going to do things that the kids aren't going to like mm -hmm. that i'm going to do things i don't i don't look i look back and go i should have done that better Mm -hmm. But, you know, ultimately, I'm not, I'm, in 20 years, I'm not going to be the person I am today. I'm going to be somebody else. So that's kind of what the poem is about. Mm -hmm. It's, I was angry, but it wasn't, it wasn't at, it wasn't at today. It wasn't at, like, my mother today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my parents did a good job. It was, it was the, it was the past. And that's where I was having the struggle. Mm -hmm. That's why I waited so long to be a parent. I wasn't sure I was going to be a good parent because of, I had this thing, you know, you're, if you're, if your family is this way, you're this way, you know, there's all this, these little statistics, if your family is this, you're going to be that. So that's kind of where it was. And that's where my mind was at the time, which brought us to the, like the medical part. So now we move past this. This was really good for me, actually. Um, I, I saw, I kind of pushed that stuff behind, that stuff that, that grief or whatever it was I was holding on to, the anger, I tried to get rid of as much of that as I could. So we went to the, to the other, the medical doctor, the specialist, and 
it's very expensive. I mean, I don't know how, if you don't have health insurance, so each, each uh, I had health insurance which covered 50% of the procedures, mm-hmm. right? So just to meet with the specialist, I think it was like $800. Mm. Just to talk, like just right. to say, here's your, here's your options. You could take, <laughs> take these vitamins and that's, here you can do in vitro and here's the, they had like several options and each one was around $25,000. And like I said, we just we just had my wife, uh, you know, kind of come off work, and and we were okay, but it was still, that's a lot of money to to take out of your budget. Sure. And uh, so that wasn't really viable for us at that point. I mean, we were gonna say, um, I don't I don't know if this is gonna work, mm-hmm. but um, I did try, I did try uh, one because I had to do like a sample of me, so uh-huh. I did try to do. A couple of the sessions and that also resulted in a poem because it, it was very awkward for me as a as a man to to have to perform and provide samples on the spot like in, at any time of the day and it was very i don't know if it was it was it was shameful it was embarrassing it was funny it was scary and I had to, I, that became the next poem that I wrote about in that, in that thing. And that's the one I gave you. It's called My Part. Yes, yes. Read that. That one, I, that's one more funny. Mm-hmm. This is more of a funny one because it talks about the meeting we had with the specialist. My wife and I had, like, as we talked to the specialist, and I use humor sometimes inappropriately because I'm uncomfortable, like as a sort of mechanism. Sure. So, as sure. she's explaining stuff to us, you know, I'm, I'm having this sort of narrative with my wife, probably inappropriate. We're having this sort of inappropriate thing while we're talking to the, uh-huh. to the so that's what that, <laughs> so I'll read that one. That's on, that's on page 19 that we find it. So this one, I, I completely different from the, the epistle one with my mom when I'm working through a different kind of feeling. Mm-hmm. This one, I'm working through uh, just my own baggage of being a man and some, you know, someone prescribing me to, to perform in a room right next door while there's someone outside the door. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it was surreal. It's like a surreal moment, you know, like the doctor's telling me I need to do this. So, so this poem is called uh, My Part. Mm-hmm. All right. She doesn't really need me. The doctor said all she needs is my sperm and an assurance that I can produce it for her on demand. The husband's part is actually pretty simple, she says, and I laugh because her envy of my part is not for my part at all, but for my role. And so I start thinking about my part and about my role, and then I start thinking about my part and my role and my job and about this one little thing she needs me to be ready to do at the drop of a hat. Oh, I say with just enough irony and deadpan that my wife has to elbow me to fight fight off a smile. I think I'm up for it, I finish. And my wife rolls her eyes and asks the doctor another question after that. Does my husband need to be there? Which really means, does my husband need to be here right now having this conversation with us? Which reminds me of my part again and my role again and my job again. Which reminds me that my promise, my wife, that I'd be good today no matter what. But no, the doctor says a bit thoughtless on her part. The husband does not need to come. And the good doctor makes me a liar now too because I can't help but laugh. I can't help it. She made me laugh. She made me lie. Elbow me all you want, honey, but it's her fault. I'm afraid. I'm afraid it's her fault. I'm afraid it's not my fault. I'm not afraid. It's my I'm afraid. I've never been more afraid of my part. Yes. So that's, that was our, that was our kind of the end. Once I got to that stage, I was done. Well, and all the, all the words that take on different meanings, right? (laughs) Conversation like that. And I mean, if you think about many ways how shut down our society is, the whole idea of masturbating and like not like hiding that. And then then it's like, oh, go in there. And we all know what we're doing in there. It's supposed to be a shame. Like it feels like a shameful thing, but the doctor is telling you to do it. And then I'm like in there and there's a nurse outside and I'm thinking like, how long do I take? (laughs) I don't want to be too fast or too... Like there's all these like these things that go through your mind, and I just think this is absurd. Like the whole thing is, 
is weird and nobody ever told me no men don't ever talk about this like uh -huh. we, we don't open up to each other like our buddies and we don't tell them yeah. so that this has to be this has to be something to discuss and, and it's great and I, I just i love it i love it that yeah. so, so like, like the next thing like the next phase was um we were going to think about originally adoption originally we, we thought about it and the, the process for that is also about $25,000. Mm. And they have a different, they have a different setup. So they, they have like a, like an agency you work with and they kind of put queries out for women who are pregnant, but you know, don't want to don't want to don't want to have the baby themselves. So you mat, they pair you up with these women, you and a lawyer, you try to team up with a lawyer and you, you know, you pay for her medical care, her health insurance, the legal paperwork, all this stuff. And then when the child is born, um, you know, she can, this is the tough part. This is the part that was really hard is she can give you the child or not. Right. And then I heard like up to, up to 10 to 15% of the time, um, it turns out to be not. Mm -hmm. And with the financial situation we were in and just what we had been going through and the fact that the doctor said we still weren't unable to conceive we were still kind of like trying throughout that process we thought maybe that wasn't the right that wasn't the right path either mm -hmm. um, we thought about it for a while and you know we shed some tears it was a difficult time especially for my wife this is the this is the part that you know i talked about how men feel this is the part i think i don't i can't say for sure but i would imagine the concept of motherhood Mm -hmm. for a woman is the same as I'm as a man I'm supposed to be the guy who conceives as a woman I would imagine it's something similar I'm the one who's supposed to give life and and do this and why, why can't I do it yeah. come, so what's wrong with me why can't I do this I think my wife is going through similar things on her own in her own way and so we try to talk a lot and we try to get through that and you know we would get back to adoption later but we kind of this is where we took our turn and this is the one that really sort of changed everything. Mm -hmm. And that's when we, we heard about uh, one of our like, neighbor friends and one of my wife's friends was fostering um, kids. Mm -hmm. And you know, I thought, let's try that. You know, I, was, I was a foster kid and that helped me. Like somebody was willing to you know, take care of me while you know, my, my parents worked on their, their end of the thing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they was able to get back with my parents and, um, that's kind of the goal in foster care is to get, get kids through that time, that mm -hmm. difficult time and get them to, you know, the care they need and onto the family who works out whatever issues they have. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, well, the and there was, I want to say there was such a readiness from the two of you also that, that you were making life choices to ready the house, ready your lives, right? Like there was room in your life. Totally. Yeah, in order to in order to get your there's a lot of uh, certification. So, like you said, in order to be certified to become a foster parent, it takes a long time. Uh -huh. Your house has to be certified. You have to do all kinds of safety measures, evacuation plans. Uh, everything has to be. They, they come to your home and they check. There has to be a room, like a, a separate room for each kid that you want to foster. Um, there's a lot of classes you need to take. Uh, and a lot of classes you need to, to take for relearning, like to continuing education throughout the time in order to maintain your, your, I guess, certification or license or whatever it is that you get as a foster parent with the agency. So it's a commitment. It's not a, and it's not a, uh, you know, just something you just kind of. Like, you know, like, go fill out a form yeah. and here, yeah. here's, here's a kid. And, so, and I heard too, like, I heard like sometimes when you're trying to conceive, and you're having difficulty, a lot of times what happens is people adopt or they foster and something happens like a, a release or something and you end up getting pregnant anyway. So right, sometimes right. you end up, you, you get adopted. Sometimes kid, people will have another child, they'll have their first child even after they adopt. So there was still hope for us, you know. My wife's five years younger than me, so um, I thought, you know, we still have a good shot. Mm -hmm. And at the, in the, at the same time, while we're kind of conceiving, we could be 
sort of having the having the Parrington experience mm -hmm. and at the same time helping you know some troubled kids get get the care and the love they needed while mm -hmm. their parents are figuring out their their lives mm -hmm. and I thought this is great and I, I feel like that that was the moment that triggered another kind of thinking in me and I started thinking about my stepfather mm -hmm. right so here's a guy when when my mother my mother uh, was able to get us back and 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 to re return to our normal lives and get uh, our family back together um, you know she ended up uh, you know getting married to this man mm -hmm. my stepfather and he he decided that he wanted to be with her with with three three kids three kids that were you know, just in the, out of the, you know, the system, we were, you know, we had some troubles, we had some uh, issues and um, he was willing to, to join the family, to, to be a part of the family, to selflessly um, help, uh, my, you know, help my mom and help everybody uh, get through this time. And it was something I was thinking about at that time. You don't think about it as you're growing up, mm -hmm. you know, how much you appreciate your parents or what they did or what they had to do. My parents had to do a lot of things to get out of this hole, mm -hmm. to, to put us through the right schools, to do what we needed to do. And they did, they did a great job. Mm -hmm. And what, ha what happens is when you're, it's your turn to become a parent, that's when you start to, to realize the struggle, the sacrifices, the, the things that they did. You know, and you're going to have, just like I said, you're going to have anger and complaints and um, you know, I wish they did this better or they did that better or this. Everybody, I think everybody has that and that's normal. And uh, this, this poem became one of those epistles, like that idea of um, I need to say something to my stepfather mm -hmm. in, in that same style, that regarding like an email form. So that one is, uh, that one's on page eight. I'll read that one. This one, different tone also. So this, the first one was a little angry. Right? This one was a little... The last one was a little humorous. Uh -huh. This one is grateful. It's mm -hmm. a little, um, it's hopeful. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's, it has some dark parts because like, we had we had dark times and we went through. But I think ultimately, it's a it's a positive one. And that's what I was trying to to incense is that idea. someday you know, my my kids are gonna think the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah? All right, so this one is it's called Regarding Your Stepfather. Biology begs to differ. You are not the father. Unsmilingly smiling with all the harm, joy, charm of Maury Povich, of goddamn Maury Povich. <laughs> Our relationship then, from the jump, decidedly doomed by nature, speciously subsumed in the nomenclature, was always a hard and harsh step away, and a huge step down in the tired and tried taxonomy of this our nuclear family. I'll know no greater injustice than that single arm's length. Your nature to nurture helped foster in me a patient strength to face and finally face up to the flaming wrath that stole my ears from that unworthy husbander of my greatest fears and the quiet consummation hidden, always hidden, one step beyond the brilliant shock of heaven peeping just beneath the bottom of the door. You are not my father, no sir. You were so much more, mm. and that's a mm. beautiful. Yeah, so that's the one that kind of prepared me to take this step. That helped me think. You know, my stepfather sacrificed a lot. He took on these kids. He took on my mom. He 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 helped me. He was at all the games. He went to the things, the graduations, and the and the stuff. And um, you know, he he's my model for uh, being a father mm -hmm. you know, I, I didn't have a relationship with my biological father after that i mean i was a, i was an infant or i was young so i didn't have a relationship with him so i don't i don't know i don't have the same like this longing like who do i come from because this man filled that he did this amazing thing and made that happen yeah. so that one that one really put it put this process into place for me mm -hmm. 
for my wife, we had, I don't, I'm not sure what she was um, using to kind of work on this stuff or get through it, but we talked about it a lot. Mm -hmm. We talked about the decisions we wanted to make together. Um, like this idea of staying home, this idea of, of how we were going to, how we were going to do this process. So we tried to communicate throughout the whole process, even though our perspectives were completely different. We each knew the other person was going through something. And at this, by the time this was happening, um, was right about when we, when we were doing the application and the certification to become foster parents. Mm. So this became a very um, sentimental, emotional time of reflection where you look back and you say, okay, look at what my stepfather did. That's amazing. I want to do want to yeah. do that too. So that's well, it kind showed of you, it, it gave you a chance to really look at how you can love someone who isn't a biological child, yeah. right? And, and yeah. so I think that's sometimes what people question. And I know you have another poem um, to tie in with this topic, but that's uh, the the thing that I want to say for the listeners, because the, the anyone listening may not be going through a situation of becoming a parent, but maybe the, you had an idea of a certain kind of job you were going to have forever. And now that right. job isn't there. And it's these, these moments where we, we have a certain vision for what we think is going to happen in our lives and something that seems so natural. And then it's... It, all the feelings that come up from that. But I was thinking about how when you said that Nancy had a friend or a friend so, knew of someone who was fostering. And so even to have, be open to a new idea and then it, it kind of comes into form where you say, oh, oh, like people do that. Yeah. You know, like this is a thing. And then you having the experience of having been fostered of like, oh, this is, you know, right. this is something normal. that we yeah, can it's a do, normal right, right, right. So it's like an idea that might not have even occurred to you, or that you hadn't seen or felt, and and those those kind of doors or windows of possibility that open, that lead to something amazing. Totally. Yeah. And that's that's the next part is like, look, okay, there, there's there's preparing your home and taking classes and preparing your mind and reading books and preparing with your wife but having children in the home is is nothing like it's nothing like that right. so you can't prepare for that and what what comes with that um there's a with the with the foster process you know they, they have to have a lot of safety um processes in place mm -hmm. so there's there's like meetings um with social workers once a week they have like a a, a county worker then they have like a, a agency social worker they come uh, every week one comes every month uh, they can inspect your house anytime they can just come and knock and you got to be willing to uh, open your your life to uh, this kind of inspection at any time because these wow. children their safety comes first sure and your privacy your rights your thing and there's a lot of issues with that. I think if people out there are thinking about becoming a foster parent, you need to consider um, a lot of these, the stuff we're talking about and talk to your agency and talk to other parents. There's a lot of Facebook groups you can go on and talk to foster parents and think about all these things before you, um, you know, jump into it because it's huge. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it changes your whole life. Yeah. The, you know, the home, the way your home is set up, the way um, your privacy is involved, the, the, the things that you have to do in order to have this great opportunity to, you know, raise, raise these kids while their um, parents are working on themselves. And that's the first goal, right? People need to remember that. The right. first goal is to reunite the kids with the parents. That's the first goal. If that can't happen, then they have an opportunity in some cases in order to adopt or to take on new, a new um, foster family or foster kids and, uh, so when, when we got to that stage, we got to the, we actually had the, we had uh, the first, the first call we got. So this is really weird. I was, I was in the hospital and I had, um, I had recently had a heart attack. 
Oh my, oh yeah, now I remember, right. right. So like I had, a, I, was, I was overweight and I, had, I was, wasn't taking my account. I was really stressed out and all this stuff. And that's, and I ended up having a heart attack and where I was working too much, I was just, it was crazy. So I had to make more changes in my life. Um, during, this is right before that. So, um, you know, I lost a hundred pounds. I had to do a lot of, uh, of work on myself and just doing that, um, you learn, you, you start the same thing. Why am I this way? Why am I the way I am? Why do I, why do I weigh a hundred pounds? Why am I a hundred pounds overweight? Why am I, um, you know, doing this to myself? Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be, I'm going to have these kids. I need to be there for them. I'm going to be, I can't just have a heart attack and leave them there with my wife not working. Right. 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 So there's a whole new, um, my, again, another mindset where you go, um, you know, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was betraying my wife. Mm -hmm. I was setting her up for failure. And this was tough for me. I was like, mm -hmm. uh, I need to, I need to get my life in order. Like not big, just big wake up call. Right, big, big, big one. one. I was like, yeah. You know, I was like, and I had another heart attack almost immediately after. Oh my gosh. So it was like, I don't know what's going on. And I just, I just decided I need to get healthy. I need to get better. I need to be a better husband. I need to be a better uh, person to myself. Mm -hmm. And part of that was this, that, the next poem that I'm at, the fourth one, which was it's called This Year Romeo. I wrote it, this one for Nancy, mm -hmm. and it's a sonnet. It's one of those Shakespeare like love poem type things, mm -hmm. but it's, it's kind of an apology and an explanation of, of what I thought was the problem, which is this baggage I still had from my biological father. Mm -hmm. I felt like um, I was going to be that. I was going to be this thing instead of my stepfather who really stepped up i i you know i have the blood of this other man yeah i'm gonna be like him i'm gonna abandon the kids i'm gonna mm -hmm. be an alcoholic i'm gonna do something bad and it's just in your mind because people tell you that when you're when your parents are this when you're a foster kid your chances of this when you're when you're someone in your family commits suicide your chances of this mm -hmm. so there's all these numbers that are working against me and it's, I'm kind of sabotaging myself. I'm smoking. I was smoking. I was eating. I was being unhealthy, not exercising. I was working from home way too much. I was doing all kinds of books and reviews and writing and everything I could do all the time, not leaving the house, not getting outside, just, you know, and that's, that's what really kind of brought on this, this, the next poem, the, the one that's called This Year Romeo on page 17. And I wrote this for Nancy. And it was just something, even though we were so communicative, we were so open, I thought. We were so telling each other everything. I, I really thought we were. But then when I, I was having these feelings, I realized we weren't. I wasn't anyway. Mm -hmm. I was still harboring something. And then this really helped me bring it up, and then we could talk about it afterwards. So this was really helpful to me. So it's called This Your Romeo and His Oubliette. The scales have fallen from my eyes, and straight away I can finally see. The little bundle you so prize holds none of the crippling anxiety and irrational fear that has limited our lives as friends turn lovers, now husband and wife. I was stubborn too, I admit it's true, but my misgivings had nothing to do with you. I was afraid of the donor's resume, the boogeyman who poisoned my DNA. Mixed up, I was weak, and I apologize. I let poor judgment lapse into compromise because of another man's transgression and sin. I promise it will never happen again. Mm -hmm. so this was this was me. <laughs> Just really, I mean, every time I've read that, and now you reading it, it's like really, really touching yeah, I mean, me. Is that you know when when I hear you talking and when with you reading, it's like the poetry helped draw it out of you in a sense. So yes, you and Nancy were talking and you were being honest and they were sharing feelings and everything. But there are these parts of ourselves that we don't even know are in there. We don't even know what that is underneath. And 
just that's such a beautiful poem of revealing the those parts of yourself that maybe you didn't. After that, I, I, uh, I stopped drinking. I stopped smoking. Um, I, I've lost a hundred pounds. I that was the thing. You people always say there's some thing that, that has to happen for you before you to make these decisions or to make these. You know, maybe like rock bottom or something like that. There's some physical rock bottom that I hit on my health yeah. and you know having a heart attack in the hospital and they gave me this little dog like a like a dog to like a pal to play with while you're in the hospital and I was there for five days and this is the scariest this is the scariest part I, I can't believe it so we were in the hospital I was in the hospital like the, right before that I had I had you know lost my job there was a financial meltdown and thing that was going on so I was in between jobs so I was just about to start a new job and it was uh it was like I don't know three weeks away like I had to do like the, mm -hmm. the I don't know some kind of delay or something and then I had no health I had no health care coverage except for this Cobra which is very expensive yeah this is like uh what is it called pre-existing condition yeah, yeah this is before like Obamacare and all that and so I told my wife, my wife's like, well, should we pay for this, this Cobra? And I was like, no, it's only three weeks. Like, what's the worst that could happen? And she's like, no, no, we have, we should, we should do it. We need to do it. It's very important. So I was like, okay, let's, let's do it. It's, it was very expensive, but we did it. And then during that three weeks, I had, I had the heart attack and it would have been like $80,000 or something. And would, we would have been totally devastated. So. Another another reason why I owe Nancy a big apology was yeah. <laughs> she's just saving our butt for that. That was that would have that would have devastated all of our plans, all of our mm -hmm. our goals, and we probably wouldn't have been you know able to um, to do this process because both of us would have been uh, out of work, out of bankrupt. I don't know what would happen. <laughs> that would have been terrible. So that's kind of what was happening, Maybe. and then on top of that. That same day that we're back to the original thing, back to that day I was in the hospital, um, I lost my hearing. Mm. So the doctors told me um, I have hearing loss now. You know, I wear I wear hearing aids, and uh -huh. the, the, it's hard to. Um, another thing, as a uh, I wasn't that old. I was you know forty two maybe. So I was forty one, forty two. And now I'm, I'm, I'm losing my hearing too. I'm losing, I can't conceive, I'm, lo I'm losing my hearing. I'm having a heart attack, I'm overweight, I'm smoking, I'm, I'm unhealthy. Um, it all just kind of came to that. And I was like, this is not, this is not gonna work. Yeah. No, I'm not gonna be here anymore, I'm not gonna make it. So that's, that's really, that poem was it. I was like, I'm sorry to my wife. I'm, I apologize for letting this thing take over my life. Mm -hmm. make me you know sabotage my health and my life and my family right. you know um, this issue kind of put a strain on my relationship with my biological parents because of all this baggage and all this stuff that we have so it was it was a it was a revelation for me and it that changed everything and it was just having those kids in the home every day having them there and and being responsible for other people like human beings are responsible for their safety, having people check up on us and, and make sure we're, we're doing this and we're, we have to get all these rules. You can't, can't give them an aspirin. There's like a list. It can't get their hair cut. There's all these like rules and things. You have to get permission to go on a trip or, mm -hmm. you know, and then um, it's, it was a. No Facebook. Yeah. No Facebook. No. We don't, we don't, like, you're not, you're not allowed to share their because the the biological parents have rights to the to the children until the you know the government or whoever says they don't so you can't share photos or their names or their their personal information because that's their their parents privacy and right good i like i like that because it's so yeah um, the rules are it's so easy now to just share oh, it i know i know yeah, like, oh, look at the kids like i just we don't do that we don't and then we don't let the, the the we don't let that kind of thing happen. So we just we just say the kids, we just say all oh, the kids did this, the kids did that. We don't put any 
of yeah. their personal information out there because it's not it's not cool for the biological parents to to do that. Uh, we kind of we want to honor that relationship mm -hmm. and make sure that we're doing everything we're supposed to do on our end. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after after that after that I think we really did we did re we did release. I was I got healthier. I did I did better. I had a couple of relapses where the weight would kind of go up and down, but for the most part, I've, I've been able to keep um, a lot of that weight off. So I think I think it was it's good. An it was inspiring good. journey. I was watching was. from afar and you yeah. know, heart harding and you know liking and all that stuff. But just uh, yeah, it was a really inspiring journey. And totally. So how, that's that's kind of the the where we are today. Like we. Yeah. So how we, long were the kids? foster and then when did the adoption happen all right so we had the we got them um uh so we had for three like a little more than three years i think mm -hmm. and uh you know we weren't we weren't really adoption wasn't really the 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 plan we were just gonna you know we were just gonna foster and uh and we didn't even think that you would have a foster case for three years mm -hmm. It didn't seem like that's a thing. Like, how could you have a, like a case for three years? So, um, I think usually the the most you would have uh, the foster kid would be like six months, mm -hmm. you know, a year. I think they, every six months they there's some court thing or something happens, and like somebody has to decide, some judge has to decide something. I don't. They don't really. We don't really follow the process on the foster parent side, but like you know, a year passed. You know, two years. Mm -hmm. We have the little thing on the wall with their their mm -hmm. heights, and mm -hmm. you know they they start in preschool. They're doing all this stuff, and you're like, it's it's not even. There's no foster. There's no step. Okay. And I start thinking now about my stepfather. There is no step at that point. Mm -hmm. It's just the parents. Yes. Yes. You're like, um, there's no difference. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so three years a little over three years in they said um um the case didn't work out unfortunately with the the biological parents and uh, the children were, would be eligible for adoption um in i think like six months or something like that after they did a bunch of court things and mm -hmm. uh, dotted all the i's and the, and the t's and all that so um we we had a we had a discussion like a big discussion with my wife and and we and we had the we had the ugly talk, what I call the ugly talk. Mm -hmm. And I said, I said, let's make sure we're that we're gonna do this um, for the right reasons. Uh huh. Yeah. Like, let's, let's not just we don't owe anybody anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't. We're, our goal was to make sure these children had a nice place, a safe place, right. a loving place to live. But we're not required to adopt them. Mm -hmm. that's, not our, that's not our job so i said let's really take this seriously let's think about it let's let's do like do our thing when my wife and i we do a lot of goals together we do a lot of uh writing things down sharing things mm -hmm. and uh we have our you know remember our twitter notebook we have I our know, i was just gonna together. say our, yes, tell, tell the listeners about the twitter notebook because so we, have that, we have a lot of communication systems in place and even with all that like i said we still miss it sometimes we still miss the mark yeah i still feel like i'm a pretty open guy but i still i still have things that i don't share so we went through it and we thought about we thought about it for a long time and we made that decision mm -hmm. we said yes we will we will apply for the 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 chance to adopt these kids so i don't know how that part works like other people apply or if like other family member i don't know what happens at that point but you you know you have like a little notebook and you have your family and your home and uh -huh. put like kind of a presentation together mm -hmm. i guess you know the the lawyers and the judges and the social workers and they all kind of you know do whatever the next step is well and good that it's such a conscious conscious thing because the you know the kids have already had a, a situation where they can't be with their parents yeah. and they've developed a relationship with you and and that kind of stability and it's like well let's make sure that 
it's you know that it's safe and that it's and that there's support and that that i mean there are no guarantees in life but let's make the best choice here possible so yeah it had to have been a lot and good thing that there's a lot that goes that's why i like i like people were throughout the throughout the years i was had my friends and stuff would ask about the process and they say, well, isn't it bad this or isn't it bad that? And I'm like, no, you know, somebody, this is the part that, of the process that's tough. And this is what people need to understand. In order for you to adopt a child, someone has to lose a child. Yes. And that's a, that's a huge decision. Yes. That's a huge thing that somebody is doing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the government, the the courts, the social workers, the psychologists, the lawyers, all the people involved in this process, and there's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they want this to be done correctly. You can't just have the government taking people's kids and, 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 and adopting them off. There has to be a process in place. There has to be hoops to jump through. There has to be laws to sign. There has to be judges, lawyers, everything. And I think that's great. Mm -hmm. it, it's, people think the process is weird. It's not. It makes that to me that makes sense. You don't just take somebody's kids right. and give them away to somebody else because you, know, you think they're not a fit parent, or you think like it needs to be proven in a court, in with lawyers, with representation. Um, it has to be fair, mm -hmm. and I think that's. I, I won't complain about the system because yeah, um, that makes yeah. sense to me. I would never. I would never want to take somebody's kids. Um, just because the government can't or you know that's just not you know i just started thinking about when i was a kid my mother had to do whatever she had i don't know she had to do a lot of stuff to get us back and prove a lot of things mm -hmm. and you know, she's gonna do this and be you know super you know she had to do a lot of stuff and what if they just said no right you know, we're gonna give them away to somebody else so that became a very like a huge uh, point of when i when i go to the schools and i talk to the kids um, a lot of them will tell me they're foster kids or they're or they they have hearing loss or they have things that they can relate to and I can tell my story and they can see okay here's a guy who went through the same thing mm -hmm. here's a guy who's doing the same thing it can happen it can be a positive thing I know a lot of the times it isn't I'm not gonna lie a lot of the kids are um, they have traumas they have a lot of the kids have special needs a lot of them have drug um, drug dependencies and uh, problems caused by, you know, what happened, and they need to be prepared for that kind of thing. But ultimately, I think the the system, which may be flawed or which may have barriers, or which may have things that it can improve, the concept of it is correct, mm -hmm. and the way they take so many precautions to make sure the kids are safe. Because okay. you hear in the news awful things about kids that fought through the cracks. Yeah, and killed or, or, you know, you know, hurt because they missed some signs. So right, I, the I system kind of yeah. doesn't always work, unfortunately. Really. So Frank, I could talk with you forever. I you are always so interesting to me, and oh, you. <laughs> you know your life and your your outlook on life and and all, and I just what I'd like to leave the listeners with and. Um, and then maybe there's something you want to end here with is that one of my intentions with these calls is to talk about how we don't just go through things in life we actually have tools and resources that support us getting to know ourselves better so if someone said huh poetry or writing like i've never really thought about that as something i would do what what could you say to the listeners about how to get started with using poetry or writing as a tool of exploring your feelings? Well, that's the best part today is like, um, a lot of people that don't study poetry that like, you know, I was, I went to school to study English and poetry. So I know all this sonnets and all this format and all that stuff. But a lot of the poetry you see today, which was like that my part is just prose poetry. Mm -hmm. You're just sharing your, your thoughts in a, in a very, sort of refined, like specific short way. And I think we've gotten kind of used to that. Like I was saying about the Twitter, the Twitter book where we, we, we kind of pare down our thoughts into a 238 characters or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do is I, like I said, I'm feeling something 
I just take a, just grab a piece of paper. I still write it out or I use my notes on my, the notes on my iPhone or whatever. Yeah. Say what it is. Like, uh, don't be afraid. Nobody's reading. Nobody cares. Nobody's looking over your shoulder. And that's, that's where it comes in. The writing, you don't have to know poetry or be some great writer. Well, I think what it, what does well is if you share your actual feelings. Mm-hmm. And then when you share your feelings, it connects to other people. And then when you share your feelings in a way that is that is correct or that is uh, that is the proper way for you, you have that that healing, mm-hmm. or you have that uh, that understanding of where you are. So that's each one of those steps. So I think that's really the key. Don't try to be a poet. Don't try to be a uh, you're not going to be writing sonnets and Shakespeare right away, mm-hmm. but just try to get your ideas out, mm-hmm. and then you can put them in a in a form. You can put them in a in a style. You can edit them. You can change them. That's the best part. That's where the <laughs> goes in, right. Get it out. Yeah. And worry about the spelling and the grammar and the the meters and the things that that are later. But I think that's the main thing. Without the the emotion behind the the craft, you don't have anything. Mm-hmm. You just have craft. I mean, it's it'll look nice, but I don't think you'll get any feeling. So that's what I tell people. And I tell the kids at the schools, um, you know, right? What you feel, mm-hmm. that's poetry to me. It doesn't the form. I just like form. I like to rhyme. I like to show yeah. up. Um, <laughs> yeah, but like I like to say what I say within this this thing. But you don't have to do that. You'll still get the same emotional impact and results on yourself by by having this process, by letting it out, journaling. It's kind of like journaling, but you know, one page at a time. Mm -hmm. I love it. So thank you for being here. I have, (laughs) I'm listing the the links at the bottom for anyone who wants to explore um, the poetry that you've written. Is there any, any last words or anything that you have that you want to share? No, just if you're going to foster, you know, think about it. A lot of people think about rescuing pets or rescuing animals and how, how much that helps. Imagine, imagine helping out a child who needs a place for six months. Mm-hmm. What you can do in your home to help these kids. I think it's amazing. Think That's about beautiful. it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's good all to right. talk to you. <laughs> good to talk with you too. And thanks to all the listeners for being here. Bye-bye now.